The Visionaries is made possible in part by the Ford Foundation. Additional funding has been provided by the David G. Mugar Foundation, Cisneros Television Group, and the American Waterworks Association. Let it be me. Sharing the human experience is a recurring theme of this series. We've met remarkable people around the world who have changed lives by bringing positive experiences to others. This episode is about a different kind of shared experience. It's about mass graves and open wounds. But this story is also about human courage, forgiveness, and reconciliation. In 1991, Tim Phillips had an idea. He wanted to enable those who had survived political oppression and armed conflict to share their stories with those who were suffering now. I think one of the special things the Justice Project does is really push shared experiences. Um, and what that means is there have been fundamental transitions, uh, changes that have taken place in the last decade from the collapse of apartheid in South Africa to the ending of conflicts in Central America, to the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. What we have found is that in many conflicts around the world, people have gotten past that, and they have something to offer. There are shared experiences that they can provide because they've been there. Together with Wendy Lures, president of the Foundation for a Civil Society, they instituted the project on justice in times of transition. You're about to see that project in action. First, in Northern Ireland where Wendy and members of the project's advisory board are meeting with community, diplomatic, and political leaders to develop future programming. Then, in Budapest, Sarah Zucker, the project's director, is implementing a program of bringing together victims of war in the former Yugoslavia with four people who have survived horrors in South Africa, Chile, Guatemala, and Kurdistan. said about the Irish conflict is that we assume that no one else in the world has that sort of ba background sort of conflict that we have. What we know more than anything else is, is that you have to acknowledge your past. It's a society with an incredibly long memory, but as I say, it is a very distorted memory. We refuse to recognize that we are part of the problem. And as long as you refuse to recognize that you're part of the problem, you cannot become part of the solution. The beauty of the methodology in the project is simply because it is about shared experience. It's about taking ourselves out of ourselves. It is about examining how others have been in virtually the same situation as us. So we find we're not unique. And we find that with others, they've actually come up with solutions. What uh, Wendy, Paul, and Rose will be doing in Northern Ireland is taking a look at the country right now, or the region right now. In June of 1995, we organized a major conference here in Belfast where we brought people from conflicts elsewhere, from South Africa, from the Middle East, to come to Belfast and simply say, we've also been through a conflict. We're coming out to the other side. This is the sort of things that we have done. The most, uh, I think, striking moment of that conference was the sort of the sense that those people who had lived a life similar to mine, previously countenancing violence, had gone through the same process as me. 
self-analysis, the recognition of the need for change within their society. But I've also heard people from South Africa of different colours. And it was evident, evident, absolutely evident, that what divided them was much more than divides me from my nationalist neighbour, from my Catholic neighbour. Well, I've always wanted to be resolved the difficulty, and I actually like David Irving. I think at a human level and a personal level, he does want to engage. You know, he's not standoffish, and he's a personable uh, man. But you're not going to make peace unless you actually talk. I think we can all draw from each other's experience. When I go to somewhere like South Africa, you know, I mean, 10 years ago we were told that the South African situation was intractable. Couldn't be sure of that. So there are huge lessons about how a peace process can work and can move forward. One of the things we try to do in our meetings is to create a neutral setting where people can feel quite comfortable discussing very difficult issues. This program that we're doing here in Budapest is with the International Commission on Missing Persons. The ICMP works out of Sarajevo, they work in the former Yugoslavia, and they approached us last year about partnering with them to use this methodology of bringing people to share experiences. They thought that it would be helpful for members of family associations of missing persons in the former Yugoslavia, not only to meet together to talk about the issue, but also to meet with people from other countries who had also experienced the trauma and the pain of disappearances and long searches for their missing relatives. And we were very specific in who we chose. For example, Maria Garcia. Chile is very relevant because of the fact that bodies that have disappeared most likely are never going to be found. She can express how do you come to terms with not ever finding the remains and still being able to continue your life, be able to memorialize the best you can. Also, we have a participant from South Africa who hopefully can look to the issue of closure. The representative from Kurdistan, Bakhtiar Amin, he has lost 47 members of his family. And finally, the individual from Guatemala is also very relevant because it's an ethnic issue. We have something in common. All of us suffer of violence. All of us suffer of persecutions, and all of us lost, lose someone of our family. My son went missing uh, 5th of August uh, 1995 during uh, an operation of Croatian Army called Operation Storm. All information we've been given by Croatian authorities or other respective uh, institutions was that my son uh, was not um, identified in Croatia, neither alive nor dead. We have representatives of family associations from Croatia, what is now Serbia, the former Yugoslavia, the Republika Srpska, and the Bosnian Federation. It's very important to bring them together at this meeting for two reasons. The first reason is to facilitate dialogue among them. And in part because there's a certain level of distrust and suspicion that remains after the war and they don't feel comfortable, not all of them, but some of them don't feel comfortable speaking with people from other ethnic groups. My village has been destroyed too. 2,000 people went missing and they were killed. In this war I've lost two sons. Forty members of immediate family. I'm an eyewitness in the camp and attention, and I've seen what was done to people. And when individuals start to defend uh, these war criminals, I do feel very bitter and I resent. I'm, I must say that I'm not pleased with the course of the meeting. Although I'm searching for my son, who should be 25 now, I tried not to comment from the uh, mother's standpoint. Uh, I didn't want to talk about this because all the people has its own tragedy, has war crimes, has mass graves, has... So we are not here to discuss war crimes. No, no. I would like Laura Bowman at this point to talk to respond particularly to Ruzicha. If you notice on the schedule there is no session at which we, we schedule time to talk about war crimes. And what I'm hearing participants say is a concern that there's a conflict between the people who perpetrated the disappearances and positions of power or authority they may still hold. How do you find out information 
when those people are still in power in some places. And I think that is why people raise the issue of war crimes. I think there is a correlation between bringing closure to some of the issues that have resulted from the war in the former Yugoslavia and creating reconciliation in the region. And I do think that the issue of missing persons is one of the open wounds of the war that needs to be addressed before people can heal properly and go back to living together peacefully. I have become very anxious to know what is going to happen to my husband's murderers. That's the question now that haunts me all the time. People have applied now for amnesty. I'm just wondering to myself, are they going to be forgiven? Okay. In the case of Budapest, uh, there are organizations of missing persons in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, in Eastern Europe, and they've confronted the same issue. In our country, we are talking about reconciliation. We are talking about forgiving. We have to forgive our enemies for the sake of the country, for the sake of national unity. But it's something that is very, very difficult to, to come to terms with. I have only one question. We can forgive the crime, but we should know what we are forgiving. Did you have such a problem, and how did you cope with it? Well, we are prepared to forgive only if we know who committed what. And the person should uh, disclose everything to us. You should definitely come out with the truth. I've learned a lot from all of them who, um, who addressed to us during this conference, all our guests from uh, other countries, from abroad. You can hear them saying, um, it was very, very important to me to hear about your experience, to know that we're not alone, to know that other people in the world have encountered similar problems and in some cases have found solutions. It's also very uh, hard to explain uh, how important for us is to talk to these people from uh, very different parts of the world to share experience with, with them and to receive their moral support. It is, it is great strength. When someone asks you, what do you do? What is the purpose of this conference? Why are you going to Budapest? Or why are you going to Northern Ireland? You have to say that we're trying to bring people to talk to one another. Three years ago, these people would see each other on the street and perhaps try to kill one another. When you see them sitting down in the same room, that is a tangible result. It is the magic, it is the shared experience of bringing the people that are actually lived it, suffered under it, and putting them in contact with others who have lived it and suffered it. But just being able to communicate and having that communication end up doing something for a community or for people uh, is very gratifying, personally. <laughs> If you would like to learn more about the Visionaries or any of the organizations profiled, call 1-800-647-5559 or visit us on the web at www.visionaries.org. For more information on other charitable organizations, visit GuideStar on the web. The Visionaries has been made possible in part by the Ford Foundation, a resource for innovative people and institutions worldwide. 
Additional funding has been provided by the David G. Mugar Foundation, Cisneros Television Group, and the American Water Works Association.